Welcome to episode 7 of Pet Square. So I thought we'd do something a little different now and actually go to the beach. We're actually at Pulau Mera, which is one of the preeminent surf breaks in uh, Indonesia. We are actually in East Java, and if you want to follow me on my travelings around the world, check out my other show on this channel, Adam Walks Around. Today, we are covering the Beach Boys sixth album all summer long a pivotal record one that marks the transition to brian's uh really creative and groundbreaking middle period kind of his golden era it's also the uh, last album that's primarily concerned with summer recreational activities and also the last album for a long time with a surfing song on it so i thought it would be great to start our episode here with a little genuine surf and some surfers off in the distance. You probably can't see them, but they're there. So what's cool about All Summer Long? Well, a couple of key things happened with Brian in the early parts of 64. Well, early part of 64. First is the Beatles. The Beatles happened, and uh, that really lit a fire under Brian's butt. Uh, made him want to up his game quite a bit. And the other is the Beach Boys fired their dad come manager, Murray Wilson, who was kind of getting in the way a bit and so basically the top came off of Brian's creative ambitions uh, he managed a number one single I get around no mean feat in the middle of Beatlemania and uh, the all summer long album which was released in July of 1964 managed to make number four and spent almost a whole year on the charts so in the middle of Beatlemania the Beach Boys had been the number one group in America. Uh, the Beatles' arrival kind of put the kibosh on that, but they came roaring back with a really strong record. All Summer Long is just a terrific album. It's, uh, it's still got the kind of fun in the sun vibe, uh, but you also have, as I said, more adventurous compositional things happening. So we'll start off in the normal way uh, by going through the album, and uh, I'll come back in a little bit. So now, for the rest of the show, we change locations from a beach to a rice field. Ooh, like how I did that. Uh, and uh, that's just to show you that I get around. And you might notice I've lost a couple of pounds since the last uh, scene you saw, and that's because, uh, well, I got round. But for the rest of the episode, let's go inside. It's a little more conducive to geeking out on the Beach Boys. Okay, here we are back again in our new but strangely familiar environment. Ditch the green screen felt like it was cooler to have something in the background for you to look at besides me. Anyway, so we're uh, covering the first song on All Summer Long. Um, the first of many uh, songs on this album that are just peaks uh, up to this point for Brian. I Get Around. I Get Around went to number one. And not only that, it went to number one at the height of Beatlemania. It was the Beach Boys' first number one single. And to pull that off at a time when the British invasion was really going strong, both was quite a feather in Brian's cap and also showed that the band was going to be able to compete and maintain viability in the wake of this avalanche of new talent that was coming over and dominating the charts in the United States. And it's also the first example of what would be a theme for the next couple of years, which is the pressure from the Beatles and also Phil Spector spurring Brian on to greater heights. Now, something I want to say about this album, and a point I want to make in general, I, we've talked about this up to this point, but there is a, a widely held belief that the Beach Boys, for the most part, did not play on their own records. It was uh, mostly done by a group of Los Angeles professional musicians that later became known as the Wrecking Crew. And while it is true that the Wrecking Crew were the backbone of uh, the Pet Sounds album and some of the recording sessions that took place before and after that album. The fact is that the Beach Boys did the bulk of their tracking up to middle of 65 or so. And uh, you might think that the Wrecking Crew uh, began to take over at this point when the music all summer long is just a masterful combination of pop music and, and something approaching jazz in, in places. It's, it's an increasingly complex album harmonically in terms of its chord structure. But again, for the most part, uh, Brian is sticking to the formula that he has had, which is using the band to track and having a small number of people from the Wrecking Crew augment them only. 
So for the bulk of the tracks on this album, unless I tell you otherwise, the musicians are Carl Wilson on rhythm and lead guitar, Brian Wilson on keyboards, Al Jardine on bass, Dennis on drums. And they will be augmented on various tracks by Jay Migliori and Steve Douglas on horns, Hal Blaine on percussion and sometimes drums, and Ray Pullman and or Glenn Campbell on uh, what's called a Dano bass. It's, it's a different kind of bass guitar that has a sort of a higher articulation. Uh, that's something that uh, was often used in the 60s to increase the resonance of the bass uh, because when you played uh, records over AM radios in those days, you had a tiny little speaker, they didn't have a lot of bass response. And so there was a lot of consternation in those days of how to get the bass lines to really cut. And so for a lot of these recordings, you would have Al playing the regular bass, I guess it was a Fender bass. Um, uh, some of you guys that are more into the gear than I am can correct me if I'm wrong. And then one of the uh, Wrecking Crew guys playing a, a Dano bass, a Dan Electro bass, which again has more of a tuk 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 kind of sound on it. Uh, and so there would be actually two bass guitars playing in use and on a lot of these recordings or sometimes overdubbed. Uh, in the case of I Get Around, uh, we have pretty much uh, all of the above. In this case, it's Glenn Campbell uh, doubling out on bass. Uh, and uh, what a production. Uh, this song just do boom, and you're right into it. Uh, there's so many subtle touches on this song, uh, especially the organ that's kind of uh, kind of in the background on this. And again, this is another song like uh, Surfing USA where Carl and Brian simultaneously on the same track, well, maybe not simultaneously, but one after another, uh, overdub their lead guitar and their organ part. So you can imagine the two brothers kind of sitting there waiting for their cue and, and going in there and doing it. That's how this was done. The very abrupt beginning apparently was Mike Love's idea. Brian wanted to do... A more elaborate introduction, kind of like what was on California Girls. Uh, Mike wisely told him to cut it short. Uh, Mike was also later credited with the lyrics as a result of his early 90s lawsuit. And uh, it, is, it is one of the most difficult songs to execute live of all of the Beach Boys classic period hits. So taking a quick deep dive into I Get Around, you know, I would make an argument that, that parts of this song approach what was later called progressive rock. Um, starting out in the beginning, you, you go right in with that bass run. Do, round, G, E major, A minor, then quick F to D, then back to the same chords, but in uh, halftime. So all those chords... Uh, make logical sense to one another, but the way they're put together is quite unconventional, and this is pretty much a hallmark of Brian's composition style. Uh, usually the stuff that he does makes sense, but it's really unorthodox. So, um, so you, got, you go through that, I get around from to the town, river down, then we're right into the verse. Up and down the same old street, I gotta find a new place where I'm in heat. Then we get this, and that little riff, that's almost yes, okay? I mean, that just having that little thing in there, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's all the, the way it goes up the major scale and down, that's very, that's very prog rock, and you, it sticks right in there, and then you're... And then you're right back to the chorus, round, 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 I get it round. And the thing is, if you're playing this song, right when you think you got a handle on it, I get around, and get around, round, round. Now you're into the, now you're into a whole other part. Wah, wah, ooh. Okay, so we got a guitar solo, right? Wah, wah, ooh. And then right when you think you got it straight, now you're in another key. Now you're doing everything in a flat key. <laughs> Which fret are we on now? See, I screwed it up. And then you're now you're and now you're in a flat, going through all these crazy chord progressions. Well, from down to town, I'm a real cool head. Round, boom, and now we're back into it. Round, round, get around. So anyway. In that breathless way, I hope I've conveyed to you what it's like to actually play the song on stage. It's like 
a train you can't get off. And, and it's almost prog rock in its complexity. And it doesn't sound like that when you hear it on the radio, but uh, the song just, it comes and goes so fast, and when you're done, you're like, Phew, got through it. I get around, a tough one, but a great, great song. Okay, next up is All Summer Long, and incidentally, I know there is a weird reflection when I move my hand. I honestly don't know what that's coming from, so if you guys can just roll with it for this episode, maybe I'll do some, like, maybe puppet, hand puppet motions or something, and make... A fun thing out of it but for now you know just sorry just ignore it uh, I've made you wait long enough for this episode incidentally um, uh, the reason it took a while for this to, to uh, come at you is uh, I was traveling on the road from my other show uh, Adam walks around uh, traveling around Indonesia and then um, this uh, channel started out as a music video channel uh, and uh, one of my videos a song called my kick-ass life kind of took off and took over the channel for uh, a couple of weeks and uh, so if you want to check that out uh, there's two music videos of my music, uh, My Kick-Ass Life and The Big Bear that just came out and have done rather well, and uh, you might dig them. But anyway, enough of my self-promotion. Back to the Beach Boys all summer long. Another really difficult song to execute if you are playing it live. Uh, the harmony is very challenging. In fact, there's one part in there. Uh, won't be long till summertime is summertime is through. Uh, Al's part, which I usually had to do live, uh, kind of fishes off into a weird, you can't really, the note's almost in the cracks. It's almost a uh, semitone or something. And uh, you'll notice the second time they do that part, uh, it, it gets a little squirrely. It sounds like Al does, isn't even sure which note it is there. And I don't blame him. It's really confusing. Um, in fact, um, a quick story about when I was doing the song live, uh, I had the privilege to do uh, Beach Boys tribute gigs with a number of guys that played with the Beach Boys, uh, including uh, our late and very much missed friend Billy Hinchy, um, and, uh, but, but also with uh, Chris Farmer, who was with uh, the Beach Boys for about 15 years. And that was a really interesting experience because uh, Chris was very exacting about some of the parts uh, and uh, I, I got corrected on some real minutia of some of these songs, and apparently it was sort of a ricochet from Carl. Carl got on his case and he got on mine, which was really kind of cool. So one of the things that Chris Farmer taught me uh, on this track is on the, on the uh, bridge section where it goes, All summer long you've been with me, um, which I think is Carl's part. Uh, on the second time it goes, all summer long we've both been free. So it switches from a, uh, from a, a basically a major note to a blue note. And uh, that's just a, a real subtle little, uh, little bit there that apparently, again, Carl schooled, um, Carl schooled Chris on that and Chris schooled me. Uh, but there are starting to be a lot of these, these tiny little things like that that make the songs really engaging if you're a listener and really challenging to pull off accurately if you're trying to perform them. Uh, speaking of a challenge of pulling it off accurately, uh, apparently this song took 43 takes to complete. Uh, most of the tracks in this album were much more reasonable kind of in the teens in terms of how many takes it took to do the basic track. And the reason is that uh, Brian assumed the role of marimba, marimbaist, marimbaist, marim he played the marimba basically, and he, he kept screwing it up. Screwed up the intro so many times, in fact, that Dennis can be heard on the session tapes saying, and I quote, I hate this song. But anyway, it was worth it in the end as we got just an incredible mixture of, again, jazz harmonics um, or something approaching that with uh, just sunshiny pop that reflects the, uh, the California simple and fun lifestyle. I mean, what a masterful combination, and Brian is really showing us on this record how it's done. He's just, he's firing on all cylinders now. Okay, next song is Hushabye. This one's a cover of a song that was a hit in 1959 for the Mystics. It is, again, the band uh, with a bass overdub, a Dan Electro bass or Dano bass by either Ray Pullman or Glenn Campbell. Um, this is indeed Dennis on the drums, and uh, he has a few kind of clumsy fills and they're on the duck 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 ducks but you know it's the man and you gotta love that um brian also on the piano has a few clunkers but once again that very heavy pounding piano sound that we associate with brian's style uh really does something special on these tracks and for their technical limitations as a band brian and dennis uh really bring a certain 
Oh, authority and uh, emphasis on the, on the straight beats that uh, really makes a lot of their basic tracks quite satisfying. And uh, when we finally get into the 70s recordings, I'll, I'll sing their praises a little bit more in this way. But, uh, you know, even though, I'll, you know, occasionally I'll call out when the guys kind of uh, make a mistake. I mean, that's because I'm trying to bring the musician ears to this stuff and not because uh, I have anything against the way they play. Quite the reverse. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Wilsons as a session musicians. Uh, interestingly, though, uh, you can't really hear the band on this track, the mix, at least on the one I've got, which is from the, uh, the early 1990s, late 80s uh, CD release. Uh, the band's pretty far in the distance. Um, not sure why, but maybe it's to bring out one of the band's most classic vocal performances, uh, the way the, you know, especially Brian's, um, Brian's falsetto there and then the whole band coming in under him. Uh, again, there are a few imperfections there, but that just makes it more perfect, if that makes any sense. It's just a lush, masterful vocal performance. Gets you right here, no joke. Uh, Hasha by another first class winner from this album. Next up, we got little Honda. Honda, Honda, faster, faster, gotta love it. Uh, this is one of several songs in this album where the uh, session paperwork indicates uh, there were three outside musicians on it, but uh, according to uh, Craig Slowinski, who consults on this show and his crack research team, uh, it, it, the oral evidence suggests that it, there is only one outside musician, probably Ray Pullman on the Dan Electro, doing again that bass overdub thing. So uh, this is a very interesting track because it was originally earmarked as a single, and if my memory serves me, this is an example of how easily Brian could be influenced by negative criticism because apparently somebody uh, at that time said something negative about the track and Brian lost confidence in it. Thunder. How do you like that? Live thunder. It's God saying, Brian, release it as a single. Maybe. I don't know. It's a little late though, I think. But anyway. Um, Brian's old buddy, Gary Usher, his old co-writer, uh, swoops in and says, I'll take that track, thank you very much. Does a pretty note-for-note -note cover with his own, uh, one of several <laughs> sort of pseudonymous bands he had going during the 60s. And for the Hondells, wonder how they got that name, uh, it became a number nine hit in uh, it towards the end of the year. Uh, just one month after that in November, if I recall correctly. The Beach Boys version did chart uh, uh, as number 65 for the lead track of their now mostly forgotten EP. Yeah, they had an EP called uh, Four by the Beach Boys and the EP itself made number 44, a testament to their uh, enduring popularity in 64. A real blown opportunity for another hit single for the band had it been released concurrently, you know, maybe right after I get around. Uh, Honda is a little, little more simplistic than the songs we had coming before. Uh, but still, just you know, it's a song about um, something automotive. It's uh, about a, a Honda scooter or a mini bike, or I'm not sure how the hierarchy of two-wheeled vehicles goes. I should know because I live in Southeast Asia and everyone drives them. Uh, but I digress. Anyway, a Honda, a Honda. Uh, uh, it's not a big. No, wait. We talk about that. It's not a big motorcycle. It's no. It's a groovy little motorbike. So I apologize, should have uh, listened to the band there. Um, but anyway, so we have a groovy little motorbike that's going up a hill and the band is going duck, 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 duck. Once more, as I said in uh, previous episodes of this show, the music sounds automotive. It sounds driving. It sounds like you're going down the road. It just kind of matches up and then you get to the chorus. Honda, Honda, faster, faster. Honda, Honda, faster, faster. It's all right. What's not to like? You're on a bike, you're cruising, you're going up a hill, life is good. And to complete the whole uh, all automotive auditory illusion, like a cherry on the top, at the top of the song, maybe considering this cherry is the wrong word, but anyway, Dennis goes, go, at the beginning with his typical enthusiasm. Uh, another, just, yeah, it would have been a huge hit. I think there's no disagreement about that had it been released at the time. Um, another great story about this song uh, that is told in, I think, the David Leaf book from the 70s is that um, this was one of the first instances of fuzz guitar on a record. I don't, I don't think it was the first one. I, 
I couldn't tell you who it was, Ventures maybe, but anyway, um, uh, Brian told Carl to, to get the sound, I think maybe by sticking a pencil in his speaker and blowing the speaker. I, I don't recall exactly how it was done, but Carl objected strenuously at something we will be seeing throughout our history of the Beach Boys is Carl had a mind of his own and he wasn't always just going to do what Brian told him to do as supportive as he was, but they had a little bit of a back and forth on this and Brian said, man, just do it, just do it. And then and Carl later said that he did it and he, he felt like an idiot because it sounded great. So uh, I believe that was the song where Carl first uses kind of a fuzz a guitar sound. Um, Dennis also playing on this song on the drums and he's, <laughs> he's kind of off to the races at the end with the fills on the fade out. He's just, you know, he's getting excited. He's got a groovy little motorbike and he's gonna ride it. So anyway, little Honda, uh, fan, another, you know, we're four for four on this album, it's fantastic. Next up, we'll run away. The return of Gary Usher co-writing this, uh, uh, and uh, I no doubt <laughs> pilfering little Honda at the same time. Uh, on this one, we have Hal Blaine on the drums. This is an actual song where Hal plays instead of Dennis, at least according to Craig and the gang. And uh, he also plays the bell tree, uh, sort of a percussion instrument that goes bing. The, the this track is most notable for about thirty seconds in. Uh, the, the organ just kind of drops in from out of nowhere, just a real sloppy edit. It, it sounds like something was, uh, something went askew in the studio. Uh, I asked Craig about this and his answer was so on point that I think I will read what he said from Mr. Slowinski, quote, the weird track dropout at 029 seconds seems to be a partial erasure on the first generation master tape after which the organ enters. It must have been done after the first vocal and before the second because it's sung pretty cleanly and in time as if the track were still there when the vocal was cut. Uh, whether done intentionally or by accident, the result is a pretty cool short acapella break before the organ enters, followed by a return of the other instruments. Yeah, it, it, it kind of works, but because it comes in a little late, the dropout, it, it does, it's a little jarring and it, it does sound like a mistake to me personally. But who knows? I mean, the recording process was not a, a very exact science. It wasn't like now where you just you pinpoint the spot. You know, you had, to, you had to do things on the fly. Brian could have easily requested this effect and uh, maybe Chuck Britz, who was the engineer on all, almost all this stuff at Western Recorders, uh, maybe he got out a little later. There's just a lot of ways this could have happened, but uh, we don't know whether that dropout was intentional or not, uh, but it's there and it's part of the wonder that is the Beach Boys. Um, it's a really cool Brian vocal where you hear him stretch out a bit at the top of his vocal range, a little bit of grain in there, and it, and it shows that Brian was really getting to the point where he's, he's able to con convey emotion really effectively with his voice. This is, this from 64 to 67 is where Brian really peaks as a vocalist, and, and you hear it on this song. Um, he, he does have a little bit of a... He, does, he goes for a little sort of a showboat bit at the end. Hey, me how? It was at least better than what I just did, but it is a little squirrely. Uh, but he just about gets there, so it's, it's kind of cool. Um, and there's a nice little ringer chord to end the song. Um, it's, it, the song's a little retro. It's definitely calling back the 50s doo-wop guys. Um, it's, uh, for, for me personally, it's, it's not as cool as the prior ones, but I know I'm very much in the minority on that. Uh, and it, it, for most people, this is, this is, this is just a, a favorite track. And it's hard to really argue with it because of just the, the wonderful, uh, uh, again, vocal, vocals from Brian on the lead and the band in the background. Uh, you know, I mean, this track is, can't really argue with it. Okay, moving on. Carl's Big Chance. Okay, now we, we have our first sort of quasi-filler track. But again, it's a bit of a step up from uh, prior filler tracks. It's got a bit uh, got a bit more of an expansive sound. The beat's a little bit bigger, and in fact, there's a reason for that. And uh, that is, it is Dennis and Hal playing drums in tandem. How cool is that? Wouldn't you like to do that? Um, the groove is great. Uh, the song was originally titled Memphis Beach uh, because it does borrow a bit in groove and uh, the kind of shuffle rhythm from, um, oh, Johnny Rivers. Johnny Rivers' uh, current hit, 
Memphis, Tennessee, which was itself a cover of uh, Chuck Berry. Um, one thing about this uh, track is uh, the, contra the ever controversial accordion uh, is a big a return. Brian plays his accordion on this. And the funny thing is, shows how much I know, I always thought it was a horn section, you know, because he is using horns pretty much throughout this era. And it does sound kind of like uh, horns, but if you listen carefully, uh, in the midsection, it's Brian playing the accordion and not a horn section. Probably y'all knew that, and I'm a moron, but uh, I always thought it was horns until I listened to it. Um, I will say that the song is a little bit of a letdown, uh, maybe, for some of us, uh, after such a strong, strong opening salvo of tunes. But on the other hand, it, it, you know, it's, it, it just lays back there. It's just uh, got a really cool vibe to it. And it also uh, gives Carl a little chance to stretch out in guitar and gives him a uh, rare co-writing credit at this point uh, with Brian for the song. Carl's big chance. And now we are right back on the awesome train with Wendy. Uh, 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 you know, quite a downbeat song. One wonders how Mike Love felt about it because it's a, it's a fairly... Well, I'm just going to say depressing song. I, I don't mean to say it in terms of it makes me depressed to listen to it because actually it makes me quite happy because it's such a great track. But, you know, especially considering the time and the band's sort of fun in the sun image, it's it's a pretty morose lyric. Uh, and especially the uh, intro, which is just sounds like plunging to the depths of a well, pretty much dung, 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 zigga dig dig um, Brian claimed it was a Four Seasons tribute, and you can really hear that because the band sings pretty much uh, in, in, you know, with a whole band in there throughout singing all the vocals with, except for the counterpoint bits by Mike Love. And it's a pretty intense vocal performance, really. Um, there is, on the original mix, uh, pretty notoriously, some coughing and chatter during the organ solo. We'll get a little bit more of this sloppy mix down on Pet Sounds. Um, and uh, there's uh, another interesting thing that always stuck out to me is when Carl's doing his little choking guitar at the end, um, similar to what uh, David Marks did on Don't Worry Baby, uh, there is a little point at the end where he kind of goes for a little blues, blues lick, a little bit incongruous there, but uh, still pretty cool. Uh, interestingly, also, uh, Bruce Johnston was there for the recording of this track. He was not on the track, but he was in the booth as an observer, presumably, you know, in the studio, maybe cutting some tracks with Terry Melcher or in his role as a staff producer at that time. But of course, we will be seeing more of Bruce quite, uh, quite soon. Next, we have Do You Remember, the guys that gave us rock and roll. And it's really interesting when you hear a song like this, because you think about it, it was, it was 1964, the Beatles, Sorry about that squeak. The Beatles had just happened. Okay. So, it, you know, looking back on it from 2022, rock and roll had just, you know, was, was just getting started. And yet we are already looking back with genuine nostalgia for stuff that had happened, you know, seven or eight years in the past. But things moved pretty fast in those days. And, you know, we'll see this as we uh, go on. You know, what the band was doing in 1966 just two years later, was quite different from what they're doing here in 64 and what they did prior to that in 62. So looking at it in, in those terms, it, it makes perfect sense to look back at the 50s as if they were 100 years prior. Uh, Brian name checks a bunch of people, including Dick Clark, uh, who is not a musician, but someone who Brian always really admired. In fact, there's a some footage of him in the 80s where, or late 70s, I think, where he's talking to Dick Clark and he really just kind of comes to life around him. It's kind of cool to see. They seem to really like each other despite the problems Brian was going through at the time. Uh, it's, a, it's a very lively track. Um, besides playing the background, Steve Douglas gets to really cut loose on some, some good sax soloing, something that didn't happen a lot on the Beach Boys early tracks. There wasn't really room for sax solos unless it was Mike Love's <laughs> little two-note things, uh, but Steve gets to roll on. The band uh, is voicing its harmonies a bit lower than usual, presumably to uh, mimic the uh, doo-wop singers of the time that they were singing about. The guitar tone is also a little bit different from what they usually did, and that presumably, again, is, is to get a little bit more period. Um, the song just really moves along, doesn't it? Just, 
just just goes right at you. It's a bit like I get around in that respect. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to think that rock and roll was only 10 years old at this point, and we're already looking back in this way. But you have to love the sheer joy and, and honest love of the music that, that inspired them that went into this track. And you can tell the whole band is, is really on their game and really into it, even if it's somewhat of a, a minor track relative to this, the, what else is on this album, but certainly, you know, very worthy. Uh, no minor track is The Girl on the Beach, the next song on the album. This song is fabulous. Uh, it, it is somewhat of a rewrite of Surfer Girl, but with a lot of extra stuff added. The, the, another really harmonically challenging, delicious song that just goes all kinds of unexpected ways in terms of how it flips traditional sort of doo-wop progressions on their heads, changes keys in unexpected places. Um, just, wow. It's, just, it's basically just surfer girl. Okay, and now we're just going to expand it in like five different directions. Really fantastic song. Um, we have a group harmony on this with Dennis taking a very effective choke in his throat vocal in the, core, uh, in the bridge. Uh, Warmth of the air. You got to love it. I mean, in the girls, I'm sure we're just going, whoa, Dennis, yes. Um, but a, a fabulous, fabulous track, which the band actually wrote as the theme song for a beach movie. Uh, for those of you that don't know, there was a whole genre of movies that took place at the beach that were happening concurrently with the Beach Boys' rise uh, in the uh, first half of the 60s. Uh, the Beach Boys actually appeared in the movie, uh, and uh, if I recall correctly, Little Honda also appeared in a movie, although I can't remember if it's this one or another one, but I'll put it up there because I'm an idiot. Sorry about that. Musically, we ha again have the band with uh, possibly Ray Pullman doubling them on the Dan Electro bass. Uh, in terms of flaws on the track, uh, you know, of course, again, minor ones said with love. There's a glitch on the right channel uh, a couple of times. It happens at minute 46 uh the band does sort of wander around a little bit on the basic track a little and there's an epic dennis scoop at two minutes of uh, two minutes and three seconds in other words um, dennis did have a tendency to enter a little bit flat and kind of scoop up to his note it was part of his charm and there's a there's a big one on this at two minutes and three seconds but none of that mars the genius that is the girls on the beach so after I pretty much had the show done, I decided I hadn't really spent enough time analyzing the girls on the beach and explaining exactly why it's compositionally so great. Um, so I went back and worked it out, and just as a point of order, uh, I generally work things out for myself. I don't get chords off the internet uh, unless I'm in a big hurry or I just need to check something. And I didn't have the instrumental track to go by, so I just went off what I could hear of Carl Wilson's guitar voicings on the record. Uh, so there might be a couple things out here, but I think this is pretty damn close. Um, and uh, also kudos to Carl if he didn't use a capo on this because I'm playing a 12 just as he was, and it's, it's kind of brutal. <laughs> anyway, so we start out in the guitar-friendly key of E flat. Let me scooch up a little bit so you can see the chords. You got E flat here. G minor seven to C minor seven. And again, those chords all make perfect sense to one another. E flat. You just drop a half step and add a note to get to G minor 7, and then you're up a 4 to the relative minor to that on C minor 7. Then he drops the root from C to F and keeps the basically keeps the uh, E flat triad above it to make to turn the C minor 7 into an F11. Transitioning to F and then dropping again half step down to the minor third. So now we're in F minor or F minor 7 probably. And then we get to the only wild change where he jumps up to D flat and what I think is a, a two chord, which again uh, relatively transitions well to the E major seven. And then we're set up to again, he's dropping and adding half steps back down to the E flat home key. So now we're in the, uh, in the verse. And then we're in a very simple doo-wop progression, which is the same as Surfer Girl. Then the second time around, it goes from E flat to C7, which sounds wild, but again, you're only adding one note and you are moving one 
other note up a half step to go from E flat to C7. So it's very logical. And then he moves up a four. And then here again is that wild move up to D flat, which sets up a whole nother thing in that same uh, D flat two to E major seven thing. The girls on the beach. And again, this is very logical. E minor seven, I'm sorry, E major seven to C sharp or D flat minor seven. And then this one's really cool. A six down to F sharp minor seven, which again is basically the same chord. He's just moving the root. And then uh, the other really wild move is he's going up to um, B flat for this kind of strange four, uh, four chord. So that just takes us through up through the course. I'm not going to get into the bridge and the outro, which are uh, more stuff. So you put it all together, you get something like this. Um... Instead of doing the D flat thing, he's doing the related chord of A flat minor seven. So he's getting tricky there. It still sets up the E major seven. The girls on the beach, yeah, are all within reach, baby. Within reach, if you know what to do, girls on that beach. Now, right there, um, I haven't talked too much about the uh, lyrics on this album, but I do want to call attention to this song because it's basically um, selling sexual availability as part of the beach myth. Now, this goes back to Surf City and the whole two girls for every guy deal. And if you think about what that probably meant back in 1963 to every pimply faced teenager that was listening on the radio, it probably sounded quite attractive indeed. And uh, Girls on the Beach is another sort of romp around uh, the objectification of women, but it, it does have uh, kind of a cool little thought in there of the, the girls on the beach are all within reach if you know what to do. Uh, in other words, uh, for, there's a part of it is motivational, like uh, you can't, you too can date a, a hot bathing beauty, uh, but there's also uh, sort of a note of, uh, but you have to know what to do. You have to be able to make the right approach. You have to have a little bit of game. You got to be a little Rico Suave. You can't just scoop up the two girls and take them on home. Uh, you kind of got to have a little, you got to put a little work in. So I, I yeah, no one would call this lyric feminist, um, but sort of, I, I do like that thought. I kind of like the, 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 the sort of positive message there. Yeah, champ, you can go get them, but, but do it right. So I like that. Next we have Drive In. Uh, another kind of fun, slightly retro uh, look back at the teen years, uh, somewhat similar to Do You Remember? Uh, this is a, a really driving track, and there's a reason for that. This is the only song of the album that actually is the Wrecking Crew. Uh, it is uh, Leon Russell and Brian on piano, Glenn Campbell on lead guitar, uh, an unknown acoustic guitar player, possibly Bill Pittman, Jerry Cole, uh, my old buddy on Dan Electro bass, Fender bass, Ray Pullman. Drums, Hal Blaine, Sleigh Bells, Frank Cap, and Stephen Jay on the uh, horns once again. And what a, a, a great track this is, especially some really awesome Glenn Campbell licks at the end. That's sort of your telltale, uh, telltale thing on this, that it's not the band, not to diss Carl's guitar playing, but Glenn, of course, a whole nother level. Um, it's, uh, it's really well done in the vocals, uh, the ooh wop is a, a nice example of the band incorporating humor into their ace harmony blend. Uh, Mike's vocal's not doubling too great, but it doesn't matter. There's just great spontaneity to it, great energy. Uh, again, the backing vocal's also a little bit imprecise, but full of energy, it doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, Mike Love on lyrics on this. Uh, for those of you that, uh, that believe Mike is a great lyricist, and I believe he sometimes can be, uh, this is another Exhibit A, a really great bit of Americana here uh, on Drive In. Uh, this, by the way, is the only track, I believe, on this album that was recorded outside of Western Recorders. It was done at Radio Recorders. 
Okay, our favorite recording sessions. Uh, is this the first blooper reel in rock and roll? I don't actually know, uh, but uh, Danny and the Junior Stuck in the Boot was an alternate title of this uh, track. Actually, it wasn't, I just made that up. Uh, but yeah, this is a little fun trip around the recording studio, uh, hearing the band uh, mess up repeatedly is somewhat amusing, although it, it, it is, inarguably a, another filler track, Brian attempting to pad out an album in a different way than just doing another instrumental. Um, there are bits on this from an outtake called Let's Live Before We Die. I don't know anything about this track, but I'm sure much is known. And when I get around to doing Patreon episodes again, uh, I'm sure we'll cover that. One nice little bit of this track is if you notice the last note where Brian goes to get his uh, his harmony note on the piano uh, leads right into the last track don't back down and since uh, I think we're all ready to go outside again let's go back outside and back to the beach shall we and now we're back to the beach because we're at don't back down the Beach Boys last saw a surfing song of their golden era they would not revisit the topic again until 1968's Do It Again. And I believe after that, not until uh, Kona Coast on the MIU album in 1978. So even though they are uh, primarily remembered in, in some circles as a surf band, or were for a long time, uh, they kind of dropped the topic by 64. Uh, a number of things to say about this song. Uh, they did two completely uh, different versions of this using the same background track. Um, with different words and different background vocals. Uh, you can hear the, uh, the other version somewhere. It's a bonus track somewhere, I'll put it up there. There's a real persistent bass drum beat on it. This is apparently Dennis. It's not easy to keep that kind of straight beat going. I mean, you know, it's not ridiculously difficult, but it does sound like there was a little skullduggery with that track, maybe a punch in or an edit or something, because the, the bass drum thing, while it's even, it's not really keeping good time with the track. Um, so listen out for that when this album was originally released it was titled Don't Break Down on the album cover which was alarmingly prescient for what was gonna happen to Brian later in 64. It's an interesting lyrical thing going on because it's talking about facing down your fear. You're looking at that wave, that wave right there. You're looking at that and going oh, I'm not scared of you. And you gotta think that this had something to do with what was going on inside Brian psychically as the Beach Boys roller coaster started going faster and faster. Look at Andrew Doe's find uh, Bellagio10452.com website and look at the tour schedule and then think about what Brian had to face coming home from that and putting together albums in between that. Brian just had too much stuff going on. The albums that came after this were a little bit of a retrenchment in that you had the Christmas album, which half of it was arranged by uh, Dick Reynolds, which was stretching out uh, for the band because they were getting into heavy orchestrations, but it also reduced Brian's workload. Uh, and also the uh, Beach Boys live album, Beach Boys concert, which, you know, again, was just a live album. And since that's what Brian was doing for a lot of 64, it's uh, not surprising that this was the time he pulled it out, but we wouldn't have another full throttle Brian focused record until we get into 65 and he retires on the road. No coincidence, if you look at the schedule that he was under, yeah, it's it's brutal. So I wanna thank you for watching Pet Squares and uh, please continue to watch the Karma Frog One channel, like and subscribe. And if you wanna support what's going on here, we also have a Patreon and you can check the link in the first comment for that. I'm your host, Adam Marsland, and uh, I'm gonna go uh, enjoy the rest of the day.